This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being, being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. If you've ever taken personality quizzes before, you've probably been told to change yourself, maybe to be more outgoing, laid back, or ambitious. Nicole Rahija's work is not about changing who you are, but rather a map to navigate the world as someone with your unique personality. Do you like to spend more time alone or with friends? Are you a planner or are you more spontaneous? What makes you feel better when you're upset? What are your life priorities? Her work will help you discover all these answers and more. Have fun learning about yourself and your friends while celebrating all the amazing qualities that make you who you are. Valeria Tellez interviews Nicole Rahija. She is the author of All About You, a personality quiz book, and Redefining Positive, How to Use Validation to Be a Positive Force in People's Lives. Nicole lives in Massachusetts and has appeared on the talk show, Be My Guest, and has given talks on emotional validation at various locations. Meet Nicole at NicoleRahija.com. Here's the interview with Nicole Rahija. In your own words, who is Nicole Rahija? Um, so I'm an author of two books, Redefining Positive and All About You, a personality quiz book. And I'm a person who believes in everybody like having the right to be who they are. And that's something that I try to promote in the world. Um, people feeling comfortable being themselves and also accepting other people the way that they are as well and validating everybody's feelings. I love that. It sounds very kind to me. Just talk off record about kindness. That's really such a kind thing, way of living, isn't it? Kind of embracing everything, yourself and others, with just the way they are. That sounds like a fantastic way to live, to experience this life. But we often have these feelings of rejection, of aversion to what is or how things are, are happening in the moment. And what would you say that comes from, Nicole? And I guess that leads me to my question about how personalities, they are constructed and how much of our personalities are informed by trauma and I would say conditioning, really. I guess a person's personality can be, you know, I haven't studied it exactly, but I can come from the way that you're raised and some of it can just be you, like what you're born with. And it can also be, it can change based on trauma. Like you can find that the way that you used to be before trauma might be different than how you are after trauma. And it's also important that if you don't like how your personality has changed after trauma, it's okay to try to be the way that you were before, which is something that I've done. Like I've worked really hard on going back to the way that I was before trauma. So I think it can, it can definitely be affected by trauma and you can also heal from that and be how you were before trauma as well. That's the big question, right? Healing, going through the process of healing and being willing to go through the process. And I often ask the question why some of us are open to healing and some of us are not. We are kind of comfortable with the personalities that we have in a sense when they are not serving us, they are causing pain. Do you wonder why we stay there and live in pain? 
I think sometimes you might just not know what it is that you would need to do to to get out of the pain. Like, for example, you know, I went for a long time without treatment because I was actually traumatized from a form of treatment. And I didn't know that that there was any treatment out there that would not be traumatizing. So sometimes the person's experience with getting help, if that in itself was problematic, there isn't really a way for you to know that that you would be able to get help that isn't going to hurt you. If you don't mind me asking, what is a um, healing method that you recommend? Does it depend on the healing method or that is the therapist, the person who is delivering the healing modality? Um, I think it really depends on what your specific issue is, because I know what worked for me, but it's very, very different for everybody. Like I have a friend who... Um, said that a certain type of therapy saved her life. And that particular type of therapy was really harmful to me. So it really is like, it's an individual thing. Like I I don't have one answer for everybody. It really depends on you. And I think the most important thing is finding a therapist who respects your personal goals and who it is that you personally want to be like. And something I referenced in my first book is that if you walked up to someone on the street and said, hey, I'm lost, could you give me some directions? The person would have to ask you, where are you trying to go? Because they can't give directions without knowing where you want to go. And I think the important thing with healing is finding someone to help you who respects where you want to go, as opposed to trying to make you into the kind of person that they think you should be. And with that in mind, what comes to me, because I love the big picture of everything. So I'm wondering when it comes to seeing life the way you have described earlier about embracing everything the way it is. How do we get there? <laughs> Even when we know the where we want to be, which is open and kind to ourselves and others. Is it possible, Nicole, to be somebody? I see a lot of monks and spiritual teachers being like that. But for most of us, how realistic is that? Right. Well, I mean, I don't really support like embracing things as they are when you don't like them. Like that's more something you would do with like a person in terms of not trying to change a person. But like, if you don't like how your life is, I encourage people to change. And if you're not happy with the way the world is, I encourage people to like work to change the world, work to do work to create the kind of culture that you want to live in, which is like, because I'm not really happy with the way the culture is now. So I wrote my books in an attempt to change the culture rather than accept it the way that it is right now. Why would we live in pain when there is another option, another side of life? I agree. Yeah. Do you have any spiritual practices or views, belief systems? I think for me, I think of spirituality as sort of like a connection with the world and with other people. So I feel like when I'm going out and making connections with other people, that's like sort of a spiritual feeling for me. I probably asked you this question before, but I wanted to ask again, what do you feel is the purpose of the human experience? I think the purpose is to, you know, embrace everybody and to make connections with other people. And I also think that, I think that each person sort of has their own individual purpose. Like, I don't think it's the same for everybody. I think each person can have like what their purpose is. And if you can sort of find your own purpose and then also encourage others to find their purpose and help them to, to be realized. Your book, there's a section that says, do you have holistic experiences? That caught my attention really fast because I never thought it that way, that question could be asked, really. And you ask the question. And then, of course, you explore the question so many ways. I'll go back to that in a moment, uh, Nicole. Before that, Mm -hmm. another open question is about personality types. I have heard of so many, like they call the average, reserved, uh, self-centered, extrovert, people who are agreeable, those who are open, conscientious, uh, neurotic, and so many other kinds, uh, or introversion, or what do you call sensitive, some of them are. Uh, So there are so many different kinds. Do you actually think the same way that we have? I mean, we do have different kinds, but I wonder what a 
balance would be. Do you have an idea of what a balanced personality would look like? I think balance is like different for each person. Like I think like if somebody is someone who really, really likes to be social and go out a lot, but they need a little bit of alone time, balance to that person might look like, say, spending 80% of their time with people and 20% alone. But another person who is an introvert and maybe likes to spend a lot more time alone, balance for that person could look like 80% of their time downtime by themselves or with close family friends and only 20% going out. So I feel like balance depends on on what your individual needs are. And it, it kind of depends on your personality, like what the right balance would be for you. When I think about introversion, that's something that would apply to me in a way, because I love being reflective, contemplative. I love being alone. It's almost like dwelling or listening to my own inner voice. Yeah. With um, the interference of the outside world and other people. And I do love being around people too. To me, and then I was trying to think about a balance, what a balance would be. That's a good question. You see, I cannot even find a balance when it comes to that. Because maybe because I don't analyze, it might be that I'm not used to, which is a great thing to do in a way, right, Nicole? To become aware of the way we behave and operate. Yeah. And I mean, the balance, like, like in my quiz book, you know, even if you come out to be one type, it's not so much that you have to behave that way all the time. It's more of just, it, it's more just general knowledge that like, say if, if you were someone who likes more alone time, but you didn't realize that about yourself and you were always going out and always tired from it, knowing that you're someone who likes more alone time might help you to kind of restore that balance, might help you to realize, oh, wait, I need more of this. But it's not something that you have to feel locked into. Like if a quiz tells you that you're this and you say, well, I came out this way on the quiz, but I actually know that I like something else, then you should do what you know. It's the self-knowledge piece, isn't it? It goes back to that, knowing oneself. Yeah. What feels right yeah, for us. I love that. <laughs> another question I have before I, I talk about your book, I have another question here about, I have heard about strong personalities. Have you heard about this term, having a, a strong personality? I haven't studied that exactly. I think when people say that, it usually refers to like being assertive or being outgoing or something like that. But I, I don't know too much about it. Right. Yeah. In a sense of confidence and all. Right. Yeah. That's what yeah. I heard too. And then I also came across uh, ideas like um, personality types and that, that are connected to characters, even character traits that can impact our happiness and living a meaningful life. Have you studied anything about that, uh, Nicole, in a sense of being kind, uh, honest, uh, having integrity, being humble, compassionate, forgiving? Would you say that those traits, they help us to be happy? I think they help some people to be happy. I, I think, again, it really depends on the individual. Like, I've seen studies that that sort of rank people as happier based on like how outgoing they are. But I know, you know, like when I was like more introverted, I was much, much happier when I spent less time with people. So I feel like it really depends on the individual. Like, is it something that that makes that person happy or not? What I wondered now is that, wow, is it possible for people to actually be the opposite or host the opposite trades and be happy? like be unkind and violent even and be happy. And we know that that happens sometimes. Yeah. I mean, it's not something that I would like advise people <laughs> yes. to, to be like <laughs> unkind or violent or something that's hurting others. But, you know, in terms of the traits that are not, not like harming others, you know, something like being, be like being an introvert or being someone who's, you know, there are traits that we as a society deem as like less desirable, even though it doesn't involve actually like abusing or mistreating another person. And with that in mind, I guess one of the references I can give coming from myself is boundaries that are not easy for me to say no, that sometimes yeah. you can get myself hurt. I remember, I think it was last week, I had a conversation with somebody who was in my house, a family member, and they wanted to have dinner on a table that we have that's 
in the corner, of a part of the house that's very dark. And there was early dinner and there was kind of, I don't really like the dark that much. I love the sun. Yeah. And there's another area that we have a beautiful table that's very, you know, we have big windows and that a lot of sunlight come in. I love that, that area. So I had to say no that day to them that yeah. I wanted to have dinner here. And they didn't like, I mean, they didn't seem too happy. So that stayed with me. And I, I'm wondering how I can, yeah, I'm trying to practice that, just to l- letting go of what pe- other people, I'm not harming them in any way. So that's okay to say no or to say what right. I, I want to say. Right, Nicole? Yeah, oh, of course. Like that, that's fine. And I mean, it takes practice and stuff, but I mean, you have every right to say no, you know, if you're not okay with something. You wrote uh, a second book that's titled all about you, a personality quiz book. So talk to me, we have have been talking about this already, but more in depth about the main inspiration and intention of writing your book. So I've always really loved quiz books. Like I, I think I got my first quiz book when I was about 11 and I just really fell in love with quizzes. And I, I always knew that I wanted to write my own because it just was a lot of fun. But one thing that I didn't like about the quiz books when I was growing up is that most of the quiz books that I grew up with, they told you how you were supposed to be, that if you answered, say, mostly A's on the quiz, it would tell you at the end, well, you really should try to be like someone who answered mostly B's. And I'd be thinking, well, why would I want that when I answered mostly A's? And I always knew I wanted to write a personality quiz book that was fun and engaging, but that the results would not push you to be anything different. And it would make everybody feel good about themselves. And it would also promote acceptance that if you're, if you're taking this with your friends as like a social activity, it would also promote acceptance of the different personalities in terms of realizing, oh, my, my friend is more spontaneous and I'm more of a planner and that's okay. And what I tried to do, for example, like in my first quiz that talks about, are you a planner or are you more spontaneous? If you come out to be a planner in the advice section, uh, like the kind of quizzes I grew up with would often say, oh, well, if you came out to be a planner, you should learn to be more spontaneous. And if you came out to be spontaneous, you should learn to be a planner. And what this does is I actually advise the planner on how to be an even better planner, how to do things like check the weather before an event happens, call a venue to see if they're open, things like that. And the reason why I advise that is because a person who came out on that quiz to be a planner, that's somebody who cares a lot about everything going according to plan, about things not getting changed. So I advise them on steps they can take to reduce the likelihood that any changes will happen. And the spontaneous person who doesn't really like to plan, I actually give them advice on how to avoid being in a planning role. I tell them, you know, suggestions like telling everybody that you're responsible for your own ride or telling everybody to bring your own picnic lunch so that you're not stuck coordinating rides and food and stuff. So basically it gives each person advice on based on like what's going to make you happy based on how you are rather than pushing them both to be more of what they're not. Yes. I love that. What a beautiful suggestion. Well, what a beautiful work really, Nicole. Thank oh, you so thank much. You. Yeah, it's truly beautiful. And that goes back to the question, that question that the metaphor, beautiful metaphor that you created earlier about knowing where we want to go. And that might open the possibility for change, right, Nicole? In that case, then we should be open to change if we wanted to get to a certain place. For example, an introvert person like myself, it's really helpful to be uh, more of an extrovert when I'm here hosting this podcast. So the more I do, the more I practice, (laughs) the better I become. It seems to me better, not in the sense of being better than anybody, no comparison, but just uh, feeling better with um, doing what I love to do and not being, um, let's say, limited. Yeah. That's really caught my attention now, uh, that message, because it makes a lot of sense. It's all about what we want. What do you want? What What a beautiful question. And a lot of times 
I have to say, because I do ask around my family too, <laughs> um, some people don't know what they want. Yeah, yeah. The, and the quiz book is actually sort of designed for that because it it's de- designed to help people develop self-knowledge so that they will know what they want. Like if somebody didn't really know that's like why they were unhappy, the quiz questions could make them realize that. Like they could take one of the quizzes and realize, oh, this is why I was unhappy in that situation. And now that I've taken this quiz, now that I've seen that this is a need that I have, um, like some of the quizzes, a few of them talk about what your preference is in terms of how to handle conflict and what makes you feel better when you're upset. And those are things that people don't always know. And if somebody takes one of those quizzes, they might say, oh, gee, I now I know that the reason why I wasn't happy in that situation is that I really needed a lot of time to talk about what was wrong. And I instead of that, people were pressuring me to sort of go out and have fun and distract myself with happy things when that's not what I needed. And the person might not have realized that they might not have realized what they needed until taking a quiz that actually asked them, what, what do you prefer if something is wrong? A question that came to me was about, yeah, the difference between what we need and what we want. Is that something that you can elaborate a bit, Nicole, for the listeners? How do we know the difference between what we need and what we want? I think, well, sometimes they can be the same thing. Like sometimes what you want is what you need. I think a need is a little bit more of a core thing. It's more of, um, I, I think of a need as something that you can't really go without. Like if somebody, like I, like sometimes I'll say that like being like having contact with other people is like a need for me in the sense that it's something that I really can't go without. It's like essential. And it doesn't, I don't believe that a need has to be something that's literally essential as something, you know, like food, water, shelter, things like that. I think it can be, you can have social needs. You can have the need to be heard, the need to have, um, you know, have someone be there for you when you're sad. Things like that can all be needs. Those can also be things that you want. But I think wants can, they can generalize into smaller things. Like they can turn into something like, oh, I'd, you know, I'd like to have an ice cream cone right now, but that's not, you know, that's not like a big deal if I can't have one right now. You know what I mean? Another question I have is about feeling lonely and having the need to be alone. Like in my case, I love being alone so I can get in touch even deeper with myself and get more self-knowledge. So I wonder if this is something that you also recommend some of your readers and the listeners to be attentive to when they are going through the the quizzes, not just in this uh, way, in this sense of loneliness, because that could also inform trauma and that something's not, we are not doing well because we want to be alone most of the time in a sense of feeling lonely. And which yeah. has to do with depression too. So yeah, I would love for you to talk to me for a moment about that because this is something that is a topic that's very important in, in the mental health field about, especially young people. It has been reported that they commit suicide more often than adults. Yeah. So yeah, I would love to hear from you a bit more about that, Nicole. Yeah. So I mean, I think the the difference between being like being lonely isn't necessarily the same as being physically alone. Being lonely has to do with feeling isolated and feeling like you're not connected to people because a person can feel lonely when you're surrounded by people. Like you can be like sitting at school and be surrounded by people, but like you don't have any friends or even if you have friends, if you're someone who like maybe you're not sharing how you really feel with them or like if you're holding on to a dark secret that you feel like you can't tell the other people, you can feel lonely even though you're physically with people. And so I would ask like if somebody is like, wanting to be alone a lot. I think it has a lot to do with the reason. Like, are you, do you want to be alone because you enjoy it? Because there's something you like to do alone. Like say you're like, oh, I, I really love to read books. So I want to have alone time because I like to read books. Or do you want to be alone because you're isolating because 
maybe, maybe people are bullying you at school and you want to be alone so that, you know, maybe you're afraid. I mean, I, you know, I've definitely gone through phases of feeling like, you know, not going out and meeting people because I was afraid that other people wouldn't like me, which is very different than just being interested in doing something alone instead of being with people. So I would really look at, look at the reasoning. Is it because you're hurt inside or is it because you actually just have an interest in doing something that you would do alone. Thank you for saying that because that's going deeper in a way, not just choosing a personality type, but being aware of our feelings and emotions. Yeah. I love the idea that we can do that with courage because I know it's not easy. And it's easy, so much easier to adopt a personality trait. Like my husband, he's an extrovert. And then a lot of times yeah. he says that with a lot of pride, but I feel like he needs to be alone too. That he's after socializing so much, he's so tired, he's almost drained. Yeah. But he always says, I'm an extrovert. So that's why he, he always goes back to that personality type. But I know that he needs more time alone and quiet time, just slowing down his yeah. mind. Yeah, that makes sense. And I mean, it's a spectrum, like introversion, extroversion is a spectrum. So most people are not 100% one or the other. Like most of us are, are on somewhere in the middle. And your work really helps, Nicole. Thank you for that. <laughs> Thanks. It inspires us to look for balance. <laughs> the more I look <laughs> at them, those quizzes and the way you have the words, they kind of almost the opposites in you know, motivational pressure. And then you have the specialist and the generalist, the private and the expressive. The one that caught my attention the most, the, the quizzes were... Uh, the social and the alone time, because that's something that I need more balance with, I guess. And then the <laughs> other one is, uh, what is your desired life pace? That one also caught my attention a lot because I love the idea that we can slow down most, most of it. But we have our own pace, right, Nicole? Some of yeah. us cannot slow down. <laughs> I <laughs> noticed that. My husband is one of those. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, the one that I talked to you earlier, I have some others. You uh, Do you have holistic experiences? Talk to me for a moment about that and explain what holistic experiences are. Okay, so um, and holistic can mean different things. So the way that I was specifically defining it in that quiz was about having experiences where things are sort of connected to each other. So the, for example, um, if like, let's say you went to see a concert that was outdoors and it was really cold and raining and you weren't really dressed for the weather. So you, you weren't really having a good time. And then afterwards, if somebody asked you, how did you like the music at the concert? Somebody who like separates things more, who doesn't have like the holistic experience, you would have a separate opinion of the music. You would be able to say, I liked the music, but I didn't like the fact that I was cold and wet the whole time. But a holistic experience combines it into one experience where it could just, it would either be like, I didn't enjoy it because I was cold and wet, or it could be, I loved the music so much that I didn't even notice that I was cold and wet, but it's sort of combined together as one experience. And that's kind of how a lot of things are for me. And it was really important to me to do this quiz because sometimes a person can, um, you know, it can be a positive thing. It can be like, say if, say if your family, if you celebrate Christmas and you have certain foods that you only make at Christmas time, then if you taste that food, you say like, this tastes like Christmas or this tastes like my grandma's house. And it can be a very positive thing that you associate it with something positive, like music you were listening to during a really happy time in your life can bring you back there. And then it can also be for traumatic experiences. If somebody has something bad happen and that's associated with something neutral, like say something bad happened when the person was at a particular beach and then now they don't want to go back to that beach. And it's really important to accept the fact that some of us have experiences like that. And if you take this with your friends, it, it might help you to understand where your friends are coming from. If maybe somebody says like, I never want to do that again because I had one bad experience like somebody who was sort of invalidating that didn't really understand 
if you take this quiz with your friend, you might think, oh, okay, my friend is someone who has those associations. So that's why they never want to do that again. And that's okay, even if I would do it again, because I don't have those associations. And the other one that caught my attention is the other quiz is how symbolic are you? Talk to me about that, Nicole. That's an interesting one. So symbolic actions, it has to do with if what something symbolizes is important to you or not. Things like um, like if you like to hold on to memorabilia, like something that um, if you had a really positive experience with something and then you hold on to that object because it represents that to you even if maybe it doesn't have like the same use to you. And it can, it can be in other ways as well, like doing symbolic rituals. If say there was something that was really upsetting to you, would it like, let's, let's say you really hated a particular place and like you had a t-shirt from that place. Are you someone who was like, oh, well, whatever, it's just a t-shirt and you keep wearing it. Or is it really important to you to get rid of that shirt that you'd want to donate it because you feel like, that represents that place. And it's, it's also about accepting that in others because I, I'm a very symbolic person and I've done things where, you know, I've had to tear things up rather than just throwing them away because that was really important to me or, you know, burning things that had a bad association, things like that. And also holding on to things that have a good association. And that's something that's really important to me. And I think I I wanted to promote accepting that, accepting it if somebody is more symbolic or not symbolic. Because what I found is sometimes, I've sometimes experienced it where people who were less like symbolic like that wouldn't really understand your need to like get rid of something or your need to hold on to something. And um, it's not just things, it's also, it's also just with your actions and um like what thing, what different things symbolize. I'm practicing that a lot more too, the listening to the body. That's what you kind of inspired me with this idea of being symbolic, like the body, yeah. what's the body trying to tell me? Because that informs the mind, doesn't it, Nicole? The way we think is the way we are feeling. I think it, it seems like it's coming from the body, the way we think it's being a response of the way we feel. It seems to me. Does it resonate? Yeah. I mean, sometimes like if you sort of pay attention to how your body's feeling, that can, that can tell you how you feel, you know, if you feel it in your body and then you say, oh, wait a second. Like my body's telling me that something's off here. Something's wrong. A lot of times we ignore, right? Those signs, those yeah. symbols in the body and we just kind of go override them. But then it's not a good thing to do. <laughs> it's a yeah. very good idea to listen to the body. So I think yeah. I changed the subject there about symbolism, but it, that's what it came to me. And the other one that caught my attention was the other quiz is how do you respond to conflict? I know you mentioned that earlier today. That's a big one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that quiz has four different choices about responding to conflict. So um, so the first choice was you can be a problem solver that when something goes wrong, you look for a way to fix it. Um, the second choice was if you were kind of flexible, like somebody who like if you if it didn't matter that much to you to begin with, like things going a certain way, so it doesn't bother you that much. The third one is somebody who, um, like you sort of try to look on the bright side of things. And then the fourth one is somebody who, like you like to get emotional support and sort of like talk to people about what's wrong and get support for that when you have a conflict. And um, that quiz was really important for me to do because I feel like our culture values a lot the thing about, like, because I'm definitely someone who is a problem solver and needs emotional support. Like those are the two that I come out to be. And I've definitely seen our culture really values sort of being chill and laid back and like that, that answer where it doesn't bother you that much. And also being someone who wants to look on the bright side. And so I wanted to put this together because the way the results are worded is that it values all four of those responses equally. Like if you're reading this, it's not going to tell you, it's not going to push you to be one thing or another. It tells you like, it's totally okay. If you're someone who needs to solve the problem, it's totally okay. If you're someone who needs to cry on someone's shoulder and get emotional support and, you know, it just validates all the different ways of responding equally. It's just 
so much more open seeing life this way, just embracing everyone, just the way they yeah. are, being understanding of everything. Is this changing, Nicole, at this time? Do you see a movement toward change for more acceptance and openness in our society? I definitely do see that. I remember when I had started this book and when I started the first book, there wasn't a lot out there about emotional validation. I, I feel like if I even if I just searched online, it was like barely there. And I feel like more and more often I'm hearing people talk about it. Even like if I meet somebody, people will say like, wow, that was really validating or that was so invalidating. And I feel like just maybe five or 10 years ago, I was kind of like the only person in my friend circle who used those words. And I'm just hearing it a lot more often now. So I feel like people are being more sensitive about that now than before. That's great to hear. So we are changing <laughs> as a whole, right? Collectively. So I want to say thank you again for what you do, your beautiful message in this uh desire and intention to help others. That's what I see, to help yourself and others at the same time. Thank you so much, Nicole, for being you. Thank you. And thanks for having me on the podcast. I love your podcast. Thank you. And before we say goodbye today, I would like to ask you a few more questions, the ending questions. But before that, would you like to add anything else that we didn't discuss or read a passage in your book? I think just that my books are available online. You can find them on Amazon and then you can also find them on um, the Stillwater River Publications website and at their bookstore. And if you're looking to follow me, um, you can find my name, Nicole Raheja, on YouTube and my professional blog, NicoleRaheja.com. Wonder. And I'll have those links on your podcast profile too, the Amazon links and also your website. So I have two questions for you. I'll ask you this one. What is another word for life? I'm not sure. I, I guess maybe like humanity or something. I mean, that not there are other things alive besides humans, but like for us, maybe that's what I would say. Or maybe love. I mean, that, that's an important part of life and connectedness. Mm, yeah, I love them all. <laughs> yeah, humanity, love, right. Yes. And my last question is, what three experiences you wish everyone to have before they lose the body, before they die? So I hope that everybody experiences connectedness, like feeling like you're with people who who love you and who care about you and that you feel deeply connected to other people. And I hope everybody gets to experience feeling secure in themselves, like feeling like you sort of love yourself unconditionally and just feel good about yourself having, you know, instead of feeling insecure, just having moments where you feel perfectly comfortable in your own skin. And then also the third thing would be being able to experience like seeing the changes that you've made impact other people, like knowing, knowing that you did something that made the world a better place. Yes, a trillion times to all those things. Uh, so true. Thank you so much, Nicole, again, for being you, for your intention to help yourself and others, and for your wisdom. I love the way how positive you are, too, in a sense of kindness. It really oh, kind of calls my attention. <laughs> Beth, thank you so much again for being you, and we'll talk soon. Thank you. Bye for now, Nicole. <laughs> Bye. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Nicole Rahija and her work, please visit NicoleRahija.com. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Thank you again for listening and bye for now.